welcome to The A-List. I'm your host, Mitchell Herman. Everyone is familiar with the big names of classical music, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms. Fewer people, perhaps, are aware of the music of contemporary composers and the vibrant new music scene. With me today is Nick Fatinos, a professional cellist and a member of the multi-Grammy award-winning contemporary music ensemble, Eighth Blackbird. Nick's diverse musical interests have led him to explorations of jazz music, as well as a tour with the singer Bjork. Thanks for being with me today, Nick. Thanks. Great to be here, Mitchell. So you uh, you have taken a sort of unorthodox professional path. You definitely have uh, you have not gone for the traditional classical music repertoire. What's led you to uh, your interest in contemporary music? Uh, it really almost boils down to one man at uh, Oberlin Conservatory, Tim Weiss, who's the conductor of the contemporary music ensemble, and. I and a lot of the people in Eighth Blackbird had uh, new music interests, even in high school, but it was him that in college, he conducted the new music ensemble, which we were all in, but uh, we, he kind of formed a group separate from that to rehearse you know, pieces in depth, and that went on to, um, he was the conductor for the group, and it went on to, um, eventually enter a competition, the Fischhoff competition, which we won, and that was kind of the catalyst for us to really think of maybe we can, let, let's see how far down the rabbit hole we can go with this. Uh -huh. So, and here we are 16 years later, and I don't think any of us thought that we would be doing this as our full-time, more than full-time job. So, so, so. Did Eighth, so Eighth Blackbird was founded at Oberlin Conservatory, correct? That's right, yeah. So did Eighth Blackbird come out of Tim Weiss's uh, music ensemble? It really did. It really did, and it was kind of, I mean, he infused us with a love and a passion for, not only for playing that music, but for rehearsing the hell out of it yeah. and like really getting it as tight and coherent and expressive as it could be, uh -huh. and that stayed with us. So as a young musician, you were, even before your time in the conservatory, you were in interested in new music? You were aware of contemporary music? Oh yeah, I mean, I actually had a chance um, a lot of times in orchestras that I played in to play, you know, really classics like The Rite of Spring, or mm -hmm. even some other works. Um, not, you know, we did a piece uh, by Andrew Imbri. Um, this was in the West Coast where I grew up, uh -huh. um, or Ollie Wilson. You know, so composers that aren't as well known, but just, I, I, it totally amazed me that people could get these kind of sounds. And I, I was always kind of attracted to that and also to chamber music, and this was the perfect marriage of both. Right, right. So I want to talk a little bit about um, one of the philosophies of Eighth Blackbird is to play it like Brahms, meaning. I think, to apply certain fundamental techniques, classical music techniques, to contemporary music. So how do you, how do you apply that to an album like Strange Imaginary Animals, where you are asked to, the music demands a lot of unorthodox techniques? You know, well, the funny thing is, is that, you know, for us, there's, there's not really unorthodox techniques anymore. It's just, uh -huh. you're just kind of making the map for what you know, the territory that your instrument inhabits just a little bit bigger every single time. So, so there's not, you know, I mean, at any given day I'm called upon to, you know, I've, I've had pieces where I've, I've sawed a piece of wood in half on stage or, and, you know, done unspeakable things to my cello and, <laughs> and that's fine, you know, as long as I'm not damaging the instrument, it's all uh -huh. fine. Um, but, you know, I mean, what play it by, Br like Brahms means yeah. is that I don't know who said the quote, you know, it's all the same 12 notes. Right. You know, so, I mean, so much, people think, you know, in our rehearsals, it must be like some kind of mad science experiment. <laughs> and it's uh -huh. really, it's like rehearsing Mozart. We talk about dynamics. We talk about phrasing. We talk about, we spend a lot of time just getting the pieces together. You know, I mean, it's yeah. really basic stuff that if we were rehearsing Brahms, we would be talking about exactly the same things. Uh -huh. So, Eighth Blackbird has won a number of Grammys. Mm -hmm. Um, some people have criticized the Grammys for, in a way, devaluing their own worth by issuing so many Grammys in so many categories. But others have said that it helps publicize lesser well-known genres of music and artists. As a winner of a number of Grammys, what, what's your stance on this? What do you think the value is? Well, I mean, they did have the recent reduction right. in the number of mm -hmm. Grammys. Um, I, I see, you know, I mean, and especially there are certain categories of music in which they no longer offer Grammys, and I can see why, why people are kind of up in arms about that. Mm -hmm. But from our perspective, I mean, it winning a Grammy, it opens doors 
Yeah. And it also kind of, you know, for in a field like ours where people might not know any, probably usually don't know anything about us, you know, mm -hmm. don't know anything about the composers that we're playing, it's kind of a badge of, well, you know, they won a Grammy, so they must be all right. Let's, let's go check it out. Let's give it a yeah, chance. Absolutely. And then it's our job. So that may, hopefully gets them in the door. Uh -huh. It's our job to keep them in their seat and get them back to the next concert. Uh -huh. So, you know, if it can help bring people into the concert, right. if it can, you know, hopefully, you know, sell a few more CDs, then uh -huh. it's really great in that way. Yeah, I, I think this the, the Grammys this sort of issue, it, it relates to, um, you know, this issue of, of sort of avant-garde versus popularism in, in contemporary music. And, um, you know, I think Eighth Blackbird is, is been, is been, is ex has, has excelled at um, choosing repertoire, which is, you know, very adventurous and, and, and very groundbreaking, but also able to appeal to, to people who may not, you know, otherwise be aware of contemporary music. How important do you think it is for people to be aware of your music and, and for your music to be popular in a way? Um, I well, like anybody, we like what we're doing to be heard, uh -huh. you know, and so, but we're not necessarily, when we commission works, we might be aware of maybe how popular they might be uh -huh. when they, you know, when we get them, but uh -huh. we really try to commission a wide array of works. Mm -hmm. And there are some composers that we commission that we really love, that we know are not going to be an easy sell for audiences. Right. But then, you know, it's our job through our love of that piece uh -huh. to try to win people over. Like, you uh -huh. know, this really can be cool. Give it a chance. Yeah. And in our programming, we really try to, um, especially for um, our regular acoustic shows, not our larger produced shows, we really try to offer a broad array of works so that you know, maybe you might not like one or two pieces, but then you like this mm -hmm. other group of pieces and there's a little bit of something for everybody. It also mm -hmm. keeps, you know, six the six people in the group, it keeps their interests alive yeah. too, because it's really hard to, for six people to agree on anything. Eighth Blackbird premiered Double Sextet by Steve Reich, which won a Pulitzer Prize. And mm -hmm. Steve Reich has talked about how um, he thinks there's sort of an artificial divide between popular music and, and classical music. So um, do you think, you know, that was, when, when, when you uh, commissioned this work by Steve Reich, was, was that sort of an exploration for you of, of finding classical music that, that was, could appeal to, to a larger audience? Um, well, I mean, we were aware that commissioning that, it was going to be a popular piece. I mean, yeah. any piece from Steve Reich, I mean, he's one of our eminent, eminent composers of right. that are living today and working uh -huh. today. Uh -huh. So we knew that that was going to be a successful thing. That's not necessarily why we commissioned him. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really loved his work and we wanted something for our group and there wasn't anything for our group. Yeah. So, but it's interesting that he would take that stance on popular music and classical uh -huh. just because I, I, I've actually heard him speak a little bit about this as uh -huh. well. And um, it, there is a little bit of dichotomy in terms of you know, that sense of what people are listening to versus classical as this other thing. And we, we exist in this day now, I like to think of a lot of times where people, people associate classical music with ritual now, yes. the ritual of weddings, of, yes. of church services, of, so, and, and, you know, it's almost used to commemorate either, if you ever see classical music um, on TV, it's usually, you know, say in a commercial, it's usually used either, you know, to kind of signify a wedding or something mm -hmm. snooty right. or something, you know, that, uh, oh, upper crusty and that kind of thing. Right. So it's, it's unfortunate uh -huh. because it's so much more than that. And the stuff that, especially that's happening in new music these days, yeah. runs the gamut of, of in, not just incorporating, but really kind of providing a different voice mm -hmm. of what that can be. I mean, it's so diverse, and it's a really, really exciting time. Well, I, I feel like classical music at this point in history is, is almost, uh, in some ways, in the public's mind, reached like a stasis. When people think of classical music, they think of composers who are dead, you know? And I think most classical music that is listened to and the big, you know, uh, orchestras, most of them, their main rep repertoire, the most popular repertoire, is music by dead composers. So, I mean, do you think this is, is bad for the state of classical music? Do you think, you know, we're at a point where classical music is in danger of dying out? Um, I, no, I, I think the, you know, the death reports of classical music are largely overrated. Uh -huh. um, 
And I also think, you know, maybe it's just from my vantage point in doing a lot of new music, but, you know, we just did a concert in Sydney, Australia, of all works by Steve Reich, all works written since the 1970s, mm -hmm. completely packed house. Uh -huh. And so there's definitely an audience that is clamoring for something besides Beethoven, as great as Beethoven and Brahms and Bach are, uh -huh. and they are amazing, that they're also clamoring for new expressions, and they're aware of you know, there is this thing, but there's also this new other thing as well. And why do we have to choose? We can have both. And so, and I think orchestras as well are also really trying to explore that territory and audiences are coming with them. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's really exciting. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. I want to thank you for being on the show with us today, Nick. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, we'll see you next time on The A-List. <laughs>